Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this installment of the Cape Perpetua Speaker Series. Today, we're going to be learning about Oregon's red abalone with Kendall Smith. And next Saturday, January 29th, we'll be learning about the early period of occupation at the Takenich landing site and surrounding area with Molly Kirkpatrick. I'd like to acknowledge that the Cape Perpetua area landscape that stretches from Yahats to Florence is the traditional territory of the Siletz tribe and Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayuslaw tribe. And we want to acknowledge the tribal governments and their roles historically and today in taking care of these lands. And you can find out more about each of these tribes on their respective websites. A little bit about the Cape Perpetual Collaborative. My name is Tara Du Bois. I'm the communications coordinator for the collaborative. It's a pleasure to uh, coordinate and host this series. The collaborative's vision is to foster, foster conservation and collaboration within local communities for scientific exchange, management, awareness, and stewardship from the land to the sea in and around the Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve. And our three guiding principles are community engagement, leveraging resources and engaging in partnerships. And you can see the logos at the bottom here. These are our founding partners um, and that, that started up the collaborative in 2017. But I also like to acknowledge that there's many local partners, businesses, nonprofits, um, and uh, city governments that also are partners of ours. And we really couldn't do this without the work of all of our partners. A uh, little bit about the Marine Reserve, since that's our focus. It's Oregon, Cape Perpetual Marine Reserve is Oregon's biggest um, out of five. And in addition to protected areas to the north and south, there's some form of protected waters that stretch between Yahats and Florence. And you can see these photos over here on the right. These are some images of some things you might see under the water. Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife is the management agency of Oregon's Marine Reserves. And you can find out more about them and Oregon's Marine Reserves on their website at Oregon, OregonMarineReserves.com. Uh, the collaborative also hosts a variety of community science within the Cape Perpetua area. Uh, many are seasonal um, that take place during the spring, summer, and fall, uh, but we also host monthly beach cleanups and our Cape Perpetual BioBlitz series through the iNaturalist uh, app is always open and available to use year round. Um, and so if you add uh, the Cape Perpetual BioBlitz uh, project to your project list on the app, any observations that you make within our footprint will get uploaded and that will help us document biodiversity. Um, in addition to this webinar series, we also host a Young Scientist webinar series on the second Tuesday of the month, October through April. And you can find out more about our events and the speakers coming up at our website, kperpetualcollaborative.org. And I always like to encourage folks to join us on our Facebook and our YouTube. And if you feel inclined and you like the work we're doing, uh, you can donate. We've got a donate button at the top of our website. Just click on that and it will take you through the steps. And with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker this, uh, this evening. It's really this morning, uh, Kendall Smith. She's a master's student in the Marine Biology Graduate Program at the University of Oregon and the 2021-2022 Oregon Sea Grant Natural Resource Policy Fellow. Kendall's assignment and master's thesis focus, uh, focus on collaboration with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife to research the red abalone population in Oregon for application in management and conservation. Kendall received her Bachelor of Science degree in marine biology at the University of Oregon in 2017 and started working at the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife as a shellfish, shellfish biologist in Charleston in 2018, where she worked on sampling, monitoring and research of recreational and commercial shellfish fisheries. Aside from her work in marine biology, Kendall loves to mountain bike, hike, and cook. And with that, I'm going to stop share Kendall so you can bring yours up. And as Kendall brings up her uh, presentation, I just wanna let the audience know that as you have, if you have questions throughout Kendall's presentation, please feel free to plug those into the Q&A or the chat box. And at the end of the presentation, we will hold a Q&A session. And with that, Kendall, I'll let you take it over. Thank you so much, Tara. So hi, everyone. I'm Kendall Smith. As Tara mentioned, I'm an Oregon Sea Grant Natural Resource Policy Fellow for the year 2021 to 2022. 
And as Tara also mentioned, I am a master's student. I'm in my second year at the University of Oregon. Um, and today's presentation, I'm going to be talking about the abalone in Oregon. So for the presentation today, I'm gonna to start with some background going over the species that we have here in Oregon, the fisheries that we have had in Oregon for some of those species, as well as general biology about in particular the red abalone, but all the abalone in Oregon, some management actions we've taken for those fisheries, and then um, switch over to the ecological issues that are facing those species here in Oregon and um, some specifics about population dynamics. So surveys that the department has done and genetic research that we're currently working on. Um, and then finish up with some further research besides the genetic component and the implications that this research has for management. Um, and in this slide, there's three abalone in this picture. There's two pinto abalone and one flat. And these three are all housed at the Charleston Marine Life Center here in Oregon. So we have four species here in Oregon. The chart on the left shows where their ranges are. Um, so the pluses indicate that they are present in that area. The minuses indicate that they have not been found. And the asterisk is kind of like a special case. So Pinto abalone or Haliotis kamschitkana, um, their range extends north and they weren't found here in Oregon live until 2009, but they are findable in our sea urchin surveys that we do every few years. Uh, flat abalone or Haliotis wallalensis are found throughout Oregon, but they're historically common in the southern Oregon area. Um, red abalone, which is the focus of my research, is Haliota ruf Haliotis rufescens, and their range is Coos Bay, but we did have a couple of bolstering efforts, um, and that occurred in the Whale Cove area. So there are some individuals that can be found north of their historic um, scientific range. And then the black abalone or Haliotis cratcherodi has not recently been found in Oregon, but we did, uh, we were able to confirm one historic record. So they have been historically found here, but not recently. So their official range is not, um, is not um, that far north. Um, and then just to go over what Haliotis means. So Otis is Latin for ear and they're shaped kind of like an ear. So that's kind of why they have that. Um, name. So the abalone fisheries that we've had here in Oregon, we've had three fisheries total. The flat abalone commercial fishery, which existed from 2001 till its closure in 2008. And then we had two fisheries for red abalone, a commercial fishery, which only lasted two years from 1960 to 1962. And then a recreational fishery, which began in the 50s and continued until its suspension in 2018. Um, and this is a historic photo of recreational red abalone harvesters in the 1960s. So flat abalone, uh, the commercial fishery that existed for seven years was closed due to sustainability concerns in 2008. Um, the harvest specifics of this fishery were that there was one participant and one permit. And the annual limit for that permit was about 3,000 pounds or 4,000 abalone. And they were given a minimum legal size of 4.25 inches across. And as you can see, um, their morphology differs quite a bit from that of the red abalone. They have a flatter shell, which is aptly named, and they tend to have more respiratory holes on the top, as well as a different coloring in their epipodium. So this is a slide that depicts some of the survey data from that fishery. Um, the chart on the right shows the areas in which harvest occurred. So the larger bubbles are where the catch was found to be highest. So as you can see, um, most of the catch was focused on the southern Oregon coast. And then the reason that we ended up closing the fishery, as I mentioned, was due to sustainability concerns. And as you can see from the graph on the left, the survey results from the fishery dependent and independent data which were the abalone surveys from 2001 to 2019, indicate a severe decline in the amount of abalone density. The blue line is for the fishery dependent surveys on the left, and the red line is independent. So that's after the fishery closure. So with the blue line, you can see that um, at the start of the fishery in 2001, they were able to catch about six abalone per hour. 
And by the time the fishery closed, it had been cut in half. So only about two abalone could be found per hour. And that decreased even further past that closure point. Um, and they didn't, we didn't see them recover, um, but we're still tracking their populations in our abalone surveys. So the red abalone fishery, um, the first rules that we established for the recreational abalone fishery were in 1959. And it was established that a permit holder could get three abalone per week, and they had to be at least eight inches um, in diameter. That was the minimum legal size. There was a brief exploratory commercial fishery from 1960 to 1962, but that was um, ultimately terminated due to not enough interest in that particular commercial fishery, as well as not a um, commercially sustainable population. In 1965 through 1975 and 1994 to 2002, there were two spawning programs that were designed to bolster the fishery. Um, and then in 1996, there was another change to the rules made. So it was changed from three abalone per week that could be caught to one per day in a total of five per year. And there was also a free harvest permit added. So a little bit more about the recreational abalone fishery. It's relatively small um, and existed from 1953 to 2018 when we had to suspend it due to population concerns. There are three methods of harvest in this fishery, scuba diving, free dive, and shore pick. The main um, reason that people are interested in this fishery is due to what are called trophy shells. So red abalone, red abalone are the largest abalone species in the world, and they grow to their largest sizes at their northern range extent. So as a result, you get these large, beautiful shells that people come from all over the world to essentially hunt. So it's a very um, passion-oriented fishery, and it's specific to Oregon. <clears throat> it is a small-scale fishery. We had about 300 permits issued per year and about 189 abalone harvested per year. And when you compare this to the uh, much more robust California recreational red abalone fishery, they had about 25,000 permits that were issued per year and 239,000 abalone harvested per year. And that was from 2002 to 2015. And there are some photos on the slide that show the sizes, um, the trophy sizes of abalone that are harvested here in Oregon. And they are much larger than the legal sized. Um, there's seven inches. That was the legal size in California at that time. And that's in the picture with two abalone shells. Um, you can see the large size difference between those two. So a little bit more about um, the background or biology of these animals. Abalone are large marine mollusks, so they're snails. And they have a foot, a large muscular foot that they use to get around on. They have an epipodium, which is kind of like a frilly outside area, um, epi outside foot podium. They have epipodial tentacles, which help them feel and get around. And that's attached to the epipodium itself. And then they have these respiratory holes on top, which allow them to bring water and food and aerate their bodies. They're long lived and slow growing. That's in particular the red abalone. They can live up to 30 to 50 years. And um, they do take about 10 years to reach the legal size to the fishery. Um, they inhabit the rocky intertidal and eat drift kelp. So they tend to settle it underneath overhangs um, in crevices, and then they um, clamp down when there's a lot of surge or when there's a predator nearby. So they need those holes to be able to continue to breathe. And they are broadcast spawners, which means they release their gametes into the water to be externally fertilized. And as a result, they need dense aggregations for reproduction to be successful. So they need to be at least within one meter of each other for successful reproduction to occur. And as a result, this is very dependent on um, what the oceanographic conditions are at the time. They don't have reliable reproduction. So it's very difficult to know whether or not they'll have that sustainable uh, reproduction. And then further, their larval dispersal, once they do get fertilized, is dependent on oceanographic conditions, so currents. Um, and they are the largest species of abalone in the world, as I mentioned. <clears throat> so some of the ecological issues that have sort of arisen recently, causing more concern for their population, 
are this perfect storm of ecological issues. So there's been mass die-offs of abalone, disease outbreak, as well as critical habitat loss. So severe kelp forest declines and um, coupled with the disappearance of predatory soft-bodied sea stars like Pycnopodia um, due to sea star wasting disease have caused even more of an issue for food competition, in particular with another uh, marine invertebrate, the purple sea urchin, who also eats kelp. It's a very difficult competition because purple sea urchins have the ability to be a lot more mobile and resilient. So they could not eat for long periods of time and still survive. Whereas abalone um, are susceptible to starvation and are typically sedentary. So they don't usually move. So they've actually had to develop behaviors that allow them to get to the kelp better, which does make them more vulnerable to uh, predators. There's also unreliable reproduction. So abalone do not reproduce at a uh, specific rate and it's difficult to measure when that will happen. So it's not clear whether or not they'll be able to recover when there's um, mass die-offs. There's also been increased fishery pressure in harvest, um, obviously not since the closure, but leading up to the closure, there was increased um, amounts of people that were getting involved in the fishery and increased amounts of abalone that were being harvested. So just to summarize the three main issues as to um, why this is of great concern, one is low abalone densities, two is poor environmental conditions, and three is increased fishery pressure and harvest. And this is a photo of a flat abalone actually. When they become starved, their foot shrivels up and gets all tiny and they have trouble holding onto substrate and eventually just fall off. Okay, so some of the population monitoring that the department has done um, there weren't any quantitative surveys prior to 2015, and this was mainly due to a lack of funding. We have a, a much smaller fishery here than that of California, um, so it's difficult to pull together the resources and the need for uh, monitoring this population. But in 2015, um, we did belt transect surveys. So this is a diagram of how that um, is done. So there's a boat that stays on the surface of the water, and divers... Um, are hooked up to the boat and they, they roll out the transect tape. And then they use um, a meter to the right and a meter to the left, and they swim across this line and count the abalone that are on either side. So we use um, areas that abalone are known to be found in. And then we go back to those same survey spots and compare those densities. So um, this is a little bit of the results from those surveys and comparing those to the California densities that we've seen. So this is a graph um, on the far left, the typical densities that you would find in California from 2012 to 2016 would be about 0.4 to 0.5 abalone per meter squared. And then they um, suffered a huge decline in 2017 following the El Nino year where it dropped down to um, about 0.15 abalone per meter squared. And their closure trigger is at 0.3 abalone per meter squared set by their abalone um, recovery management plan. And this was due to a couple of different references and papers that determined that uh, at densities of 0.2 to 0.15 abalone per meter squared, these populations are vulnerable to collapse. So just to put that in perspective as to what our densities look like here in Oregon, in 2015, when we did that Bell Transect survey, our densities were 0 0.03 abalone per meter squared. So it's quite a bit different from the California populations. So as a result, this made us start thinking about what differences there might be in our population compared to the California ones that could sort of describe the different dynamics that we were seeing. So one of these uh, potential explanations is uh, metapopulation theory. So a metapopulation is a system in which there's discrete habitat patches. And not only that, but there's low dispersal between the patches. So there oftentimes is a lot of quality difference between those habitat patches. So to, even further than that, there's another version of metapopulation systems called source sink dynamics. And in source sink dynamics, there's differences in the individual resources for each habitat, and that creates what's called a source or a sink. So a source has more resources and more sustainable reproduction 
and typically is able to sustain sink populations through migration. Um, and then another step further from source sink dynamics is something called black hole sinks. And black hole sinks are sinks that are part of a metapopulation that aren't able to give back to the source population. So they're only sustained if there's migration from the source population to that sink. So just a little bit more about what kinds of research and data limitations we've had here in Oregon compared to where a lot of the funding um, and fishery data is. This is a, a nice infographic that kind of drives that point home. So the big yellow box is around this bell curve and shows that the principal stock fishing and science is done in uh, the Mendocino to Channel Islands, California area. And then Crescent City, which is in the little blue box, that's where sort of the outskirts of that stock, the science that's done for it, and the amount of fishing that's done. And then even further out is the little green box, and that's us there in Oregon. So there's, it's a much small scale, much smaller scale fishery, and we have even less data. So some of the population monitoring studies that have been done for red abalone in this area of the uh, principal stock and science are these modeling studies. And so just to sort of go over the amount of science that's been done for those populations in California, um, they've done elasticity studies. So determining elasticity values allows you to look at a size structured population and determine um, which size in that population is most crucial for um, the sustainability of that stock. So specifically, you can determine values for the amount of fecundity or how many um, eggs that that individual is going to be able to reproduce. You can also do uh, modeling growth and mortality studies. So there was a study done where uh, many different models were used to rank the fit um, for that population in California. And then you can also do a size-based egg per recruit model. And this uses size specific natural mortality rates in order to determine what sizes in that population are uh, giving the most back to sustain the reproduction of that stock. Um, and then lastly, there's Bayesian hierarchical models, which can describe the variability in growth rates. So this is just to sort of demonstrate a lot of the research and science that's been done um, for red abalone, but in California. And it's very specific to that area because they have a lot more stock. So you can't run these same types of modeling studies on a much smaller stock. So it kind of made us wonder what other things could we possibly do to determine uh, more about this population without doing those modeling studies because we don't have the amount of data to be able to run those numbers. So shifting into sort of the research that we've been working on, um, there are four main areas. So looking into the larval dispersal mode, there's three possible dispersal methods that abalone can exhibit. And then further than that, they have the ability to exhibit what's called delayed metamorphosis. And then on the other side, there's uh, the metapopulation theory. So utilizing that theory to understand our populations better, and then understanding uh, genetic information that can allow us to understand um, how these populations are connected. So one of the largest projects that we did in the last year um, was this genetic sample collection. So we teamed up with UC Davis researchers, uh, Dr. Andrew Whitehead and his postdoc, uh, Joanna Griffiths. And they have a genetics lab that was working on a project to do a genome-wide variation study for um, all the species of abalone that are here on the West Coast. And they were specifically looking at local adaptation of abalone um, to ocean acidification. And so we ended up teaming up with them to get some samples from the Oregon area in order to determine more about our populations here. And particularly, we wanted to compare our population's gen genetics to that of um, California's to see if they were genetically connected. And that would allow us to determine whether or not they were source and sink populations. So we targeted um, four populations and used four different areas along the coast to do that. And we got what are called epipodial clips. So earlier I was describing that abalone have this big epipodium that surrounds their foot. And then they have these little tentacles that help them get around and feel around. 
So if you are able to clip those tentacles, it doesn't harm the animal. Um, they don't have a coagulant in their blood to stop them from bleeding. And so if they get a cut on the bottom of their foot, um, they essentially will bleed out. So you have to find a, a non-invasive way to get genetic information from these animals. So getting these little clips um, and sticking them in a vial of 95% ethanol was what we did. We were able to get 40 samples total from these four areas. And we did three different methods of doing that. We did an intertidal search, a free dive, and then we also had uh, commercial sea urchin divers who did a hookah diving uh, session. And that's what this picture is of. I was collecting an epipodial tentacle on a commercial sea urchin vessel. So this is um, a little bit more about that sample collection. The chart on the right depicts the four areas that we sampled from. So we sampled from areas that we um, knew there were populations at. Um, so we went to Charleston, the Cape Arago area, Port Orford, Nellie's Cove. That's where we did the free dive. We went to Gold Beach, Rogue Reef. That's where we did the uh, hookah diving session. And then in Brookings, there were two different areas that we targeted in the Samuel Boardman State Park. And for each abalone um, that we sampled from, we took length data. And we also, this is a, an example of the vial that we use. So each sample had its own number and we had a picture and length data from each individual. So this is a, a, a small baby red abalone, little juvenile. So this was a, a really great project. I got to work with all different types of um, researchers and, and personnel. Um, up in the top left, that's myself and Nancy Treneman, who's a University of Oregon researcher. And she knows um, the abalone populations very well down on the southern coast that was uh, in Lone Ranch. And then this picture at the bottom is of me and um, ODFW's abalone uh, fishery manager, Scott Growth, and we were measuring, getting measurement data off of these abalone. And then up in the top right are two of our great free divers, uh, Stuart Love and Joseph Metzler, who have worked with us at ODFW. And it was just a great opportunity to, to get all these people together and, and collaborate. So um, just a little bit about management implications. So the biggest thing that I'm working on with my fellowship is creating and researching a conservation and fishery management plan. So that's a little bit different than a typical fishery management plan because the main focus is to conserve the species, conserve the population that we have here, but to also determine if there's a possibility for a conscious and sustainable fishery. Because we have had one here in Oregon historically, and it's important to continue to foster that um, interest in the population, as well as it is important socially. So working on this fishery management plan, um, there's a couple of different ways that you can do that. And this is kind of utilizing the California uh, fishery management plan that they developed for abalone, is they developed harvest control rules or HCRs, which uh, this picture up on the right is what's called a decision tree. So you use a multi-indicator approach and there's two different things that you look at. One of them is the uh, spawning potential ratio, which is based on their length. Um, so that's what I was talking about earlier with the length um, egg recruit model. So you can see what the spawning potential of that sized abalone would be. And then if that's at a good level, then you can move down to the second node, which is density. So we do um, those density surveys I was talking about, and there are density limit reference points. So if both of those are um, at a point that's yellow or green, you could move on to uh, what's called a de minimis fishery potentially. So a de minimis fishery is not open or closed. It's, it's something in the middle. It's like a very small scale, minimal take fishery. And um, further than that, the, I think a main thing that we're definitely gonna do here in Oregon that they've done in California that's really good is do uh, separate by fishing zones. So that's why we were trying to get more information about each population along the coast is so we can separate them by zone and manage each population separately because they do uh, interact differently with one another and have different local environmental conditions. Um, and then just to reiterate this further, those that closed versus de minimis versus open uh, fisheries, according to the California Fishery Management Plan, there isn't going to be necessarily a short timescale for this to happen. 
So being that conservation is the number one priority in both our management plan and California's, uh, we definitely care more about understanding the population levels and reaching those desirable densities before opening it up to a potential fishery. And there's also um, total allowable catch or TAC. So you use that spawning potential ratio with the estimates to get what a de minimis total allowable catch would be. Okay, and that's my presentation. Thank you, everybody. If you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. What a cool research project to get to work on. Um, so we did have some questions roll in, but I always like to kick it off and start it with, um, was there an experience or an aha moment? What was your inspiration behind kind of diving a bit deeper to learn more about the red abalone? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I've been working at the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife as a uh, shellfish sampler and data technician back in 2018. And that was when uh, they ended up closing the fishery. And so when I started working there, they were already um, looking at this problem and trying to document the history of it. So I started working on a, a manuscript with the fishery manager, Scott Grove. And we put that together. We did all this research into the history of this fishery. And it was just so fascinating to see um, you know, all these different permits from the 70s and the 50s and reading these papers that people had never published. So it was just kind of this interesting um, breadth of knowledge that needed so much more information and research. So that's kind of what spurred it off in my head. Nice. Uh, how long are the larvae in the water before settling? So that's a bit complicated. They typically have a short uh, larval duration in the water column. So it's only about um, five days or so, but it can be. That's why I was saying that there's this potential for delayed metamorphosis and there's a longer competency period. So that's part of the area of research that I'm looking at is that they do have the ability to last up to uh, 20 days in the water column. Yeah. And what is their dispersal capability? So they have three modes of dispersal that are possible within red abalone. There's a short distance, long distance, and then sort of a mixture of the two. Most commonly it's short distance dispersal. So they only typically disperse short distances and that's how the populations are sustained. But they, we have found, uh, studies have found that they have the ability to exhibit this long distance dispersal event. And that could be the ability to dispersed larvae from the California coast up till the Oregon coast, but it's only once in a blue moon, essentially. And then our red abalone male or female bimorphic? <laughs> they, have separate, they have separate sexes. Yeah, so there's male and female. So they release their gametes separately into the water column to be externally fertilized. Okay. Um, do you think uh, that the remote offshore reefs and islands along the southern Oregon coast can provide an effective refuge against overharvest by humans? Hmm. Um, you know, that's a complicated question because it's not just simply creating a refuge. It's more of understanding how those populations are connected and migrating from one area to another. So I know that, I don't know if this question is inspired by uh, the California, they have channel islands and those are kind of like a refuge of abalone out there. Um, but we don't have the same kind of geography up here. So it's a bit different. And then even further, those populations along the channel islands are their own self-sustaining populations. And we've kind of found that we don't necessarily have that same level of self-sustaining um, reproduction up in Oregon. So I don't know that that would be a, a reasonable way to solve that problem, but it's a good idea. And then Erin says that they love the diagram showing the bell of effort on the science done north to south on the x-axis and that they've used similar concept to talk about scientific effort on other species. Has this concept been published in the literature somewhere? Um, well, that particular diagram is sort of an, an agency diagram that we use to describe different, I mean, what Aaron's referring to is the same kind of thing we use it for, is to sort of demonstrate to other fishery managers or other people within our agency that um, we're looking at a, a breadth of knowledge that's not well understood. So we're working with limited resources. So that particular diagram has not been published. Um, but there has been a lot of studies, abalone studies, particularly in, uh, I think, Australia, that sort of look at that exact concept, but we haven't done anything here. Okay. 
Um, and this, this person says this may be off subject, but why when harvesting scallops, you have to bring up the entire shell in Washington, you can leave the shell below with all the growth on it. <laughs> Think you can answer? <laughs> yeah, it's a little off topic. <laughs> well, I mean, that particular rule has to do with uh, mutilation. So it's it, you're not allowed to mutilate in the fields unless direct consumption. Okay, right. It's a little unrelated, but I do. I don't know if this person knows that I did. I was the recreational scallop fishery manager for a little while. So maybe that's okay. What it but yeah, yeah that's what maybe. That rule is. <laughs> yeah, is you're not supposed to mutilate in the fields and Got it. want to leave the shell, but you're not supposed to. Okay, okay. Have you gotten any genetic results back? Is there interconnection between organ populations? That's the main question. So we, we did all the sampling last year and um, the entire genetic process uh, of sequencing takes a very long time. So we've uh, sent them down to the lab in California and they've been extracted. So that's the first step is you have to extract the tissue and get it into a, um, a state where you can sequence it. And then they get sent off for sequencing and then we can do the analysis. So we haven't gotten any results back yet. Okay. That'll look, that'll be interesting to get to see. Yeah. That. What level of poaching? Any information on that after the closure? We don't have any information about poaching. Um, we do have a very great enforcement team um, that works with ODFW and they, I, I haven't heard of any situation where they've caught anybody since the closure. So it was a concern, but people are, are very aware of it. So it hasn't mm -hmm. been uh, found to be an issue so far. Okay. Um, and why does fertilization success decrease so rapidly just a meter or so away from the spawning adult abalone? So that's something called the Ali effect. Um, so it's this concept that with low densities, um, they have lower sperm viability, the further away they get from each other. So once they release that sperm and eggs and they start to travel, they lose their viability the further away they get. So even if they were to get to another um, gamete and try and fertilize, the viability would be so low that it wouldn't become an actual larvae. Wow. And why is Southern Oregon more conducive to abalone population than Central or Northern Oregon? That's, yeah, that's more about the habitat. Um, so the rocky intertidal, there's really a, uh, a geographic band that causes there to not be a lot of uh, migration between the two areas because there's sand in between the two. So there hasn't been the ability for them to migrate up because there's not a continuous rocky intertidal area. Okay. Uh, how has it been to organize this collaboration between so many different groups, such as OMIB, ODFW, free diver, free diver groups, etc.? It, it's been, you know, juggling a lot of, you know, spinning a lot of plates, but it's really fun. Like, I think that it's been so great to be able to work with so many different people. There is all the coordination of schedules and trying to get everybody in the right place and and the added complexities of, you know, COVID during this research was hard, mm -hmm. but, um, but everybody is so excited about this project and everybody has the same goal. So just trying to get everybody into the conversation. I mean, everybody's passionate about it. So it's been a, a very rewarding experience and, and pretty yeah. easy overall. Yeah, absolutely. The work is paying off. Yeah. Um, will the reintroduction of sea otters affect the population of abalone? Yeah, this has been a big, a big question. The answer is yes. There's not um, really anywhere in the world where there's been a successful sustainable abalone fishery in an area that has a sea otter population. So um, it's it's a difficult conundrum because uh, sea otters were historically here. Mm -hmm. And there have been a lot of studies done to look at the effect of sea otters on abalone populations. And there are some situations where it actually does positively affect their behavior because it causes them to exhibit what's called cryptic behavior. So they, they hide more frequently. But the issue with our population in Oregon is it's so small that if we had the reintroduction of sea otters, all of the abalone would basically be eaten before they'd have the ability to adapt. So. Right. It's pretty much a guarantee that we we wouldn't see that population persist. Okay. And how successful is abalone farming? 
Um, you know, we haven't done that here in Oregon. They have um, some abalone farms in California that are relatively uh, useful. And that's if, so that really begs the, the question of, is that what we're going for? Are we going for a farm sort of situation where we're just creating food for people? Or do we want it to be more of a uh, sustainable biological stock? So right now we're looking at ways that we can try and manage the actual uh, wild population without having to move into an aquaculture phase. That would sort of be like a last resort kind of thing to save the species. Okay. Um, and then Aaron chimes in again. He says, the thing that puzzles um, them the most about Oregon abalones, why is it that pintos are super abundant to the north and to the south, but not here? I'm guessing you know those locations. <laughs> yes, no, I, I know what he's talking about. Yeah, I don't really know the answer to that one. Um, pintos weren't even found here in Oregon until 2009. Like nobody had really seen them. And since then we've only really found them in one area in Oregon. So I don't know if it's a habitat question, like mm, maybe okay. there's very specific habitat and they need like a embayment that's very um, protected and has a very specific I don't know. I'm not sure what the answer to that is, but <laughs> that's a good a research question. Yeah, definitely. Um, can abalone be introduced to areas either as larvae or adults? So that's something that, that has been done. The main issue with that is um, you can rear them pretty easily, but getting them out into the population and then sustaining themselves is a whole nother issue entirely. So they did do a couple of uh, spawning bolstering efforts over the years here in Oregon and um, they didn't really take super well and that's because they're very difficult to monitor so you can put them out there but for the first three years essentially they're super difficult to find so you can't even monitor if they're attaching if they're growing wow. um, and then once they do hit that point um, we lose track of them entirely so it's, it's difficult to know whether or not that would even be a worthwhile um, situation. But I will say that that is a consideration in the future if this conservation effort that we're working on right now doesn't come to fruition. And then were red abalone seeded here from California or is Oregon part of their historic range? Um, Oregon's part of their historic range. I was a little confused by the question because I was just talking about the spawning effort that was done and there yeah. was a spawning effort that was done that used California abalone. Okay. But that was after we had already had them here in Oregon. Okay. Yeah. And, and then it says here, this is from Steve, most dispersal of red abalone occurs via drift of the short-lived pl planktonic larvae, but there are also occasional observations of adult and juvenile abalone drifting over long distances while attached to the holdfast of dis dislodged kelp. Do you think these that these drifting adult abalone have the possibility to establish new populations in areas outside their normal biogeographic range? It's possible. Um, I think that's definitely the exception to the rule in most situations, but I think it's, it's a possibility the same way that I was just discussing uh, the different modes of dispersal, that short distance is the most common, but long distance dispersal does obviously happen on occasion. Um, so I think the same could be said what, with what Steve was just describing, is that there's the potential that an adult could get rafted all the way up into an area that it didn't exist before. But there's all these other questions that would have to come with it. I mean, you know, one abalone can't sustain itself. It has to be fertilized or fertilize another <laughs> abalone. So there's just a right. lot of conditions that would have to occur for that to be possible. But it is possible. Okay. And then you may have mentioned this, but I don't remember. What's the lifespan of a red abalone? In, they're very long lived. So they typically can live from 30 to maybe 60 years. Nice, wow. They, they did find, there was a study found that um, they don't reach the size at which they'd be legal to harvest until they're about 12 years old though. Well, okay, that was gonna be the next question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, the larvae bolstering with California lar larvae, might that confuse the genetic population results? Yeah, so I did take that into consideration when I was um, thinking about this project and I, I know where that was done, where that work was done, it's documented. Um, and I made sure to not sample from an area that would have been influenced by that. So there's no guarantees, but we will see it right away if that is the case. Okay, 
Such great questions, audience members. Thank you so much. That wraps our Q&A session. Um, and with that, Kendall, thank you so much again for joining us this Saturday morning and sharing uh, information about your research. It was really fascinating. And yep. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much. Enjoy the weather. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.